Okay, let me. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, thanks for for joining today. Um, my name is Rob Dusler, and I oversee the education programs at the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment. Um, and um, I've had the the luxury of um, engaging with some colleagues in um, both um, social work and recreation and curriculum and instruction, and uh, actually got introduced to uh, mindfulness uh, and nature connection and um, um, uh, curriculum development in and around those concepts, place-based education. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing over here and what I've been doing in my research with my colleagues. Um, if you don't know, I'm, I'm not sure who everyone is on the call, but um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to switch slides here. Uh, we have a pretty pretty amazing educational interface here, right? And so I'm, I'm assuming you visited Spring Lake and uh, maybe you've even gone out on the glass bottom boats, um, but the site is just amazing. And we see about 120,000 visitors annually who come through the center for um, outdoor education experiences. Um, of those visitors, we see about 30,000 school children annually. And half of those children originate from Title I schools. So uh, we've got an amazing interface that allows us, uh, particularly with the boats, to, to uh, engage with water and, in a pretty unique way uh, that we feel like um, is, is very relevant and very inspiring. Um, I think uh, one of the things that's uh, really stuck out with me is that... Um, while we've been here or while I've been here, I've been here for, for seven years, uh, you know, it can get pretty hectic in the park, right? We have, a, when we have 400 school children out on site. I mean, it's lovely, right? The, the, the site is beautiful and, um, you know, children's laughter everywhere. It's like just the most idyllic setting, but it is, it is a little a frenetic, right? You know, there's a, we're kind of beholden to a K through 12 field trip type uh, structure. And so a lot of these school buses come in, they're on a tight schedule, the children get off the bus, um, and, it, and it has kind of this regimented type approach, which it almost has to be in order to, to introduce that many students to, to the place and to, to meet the uh, educational requirements of the, the TEKS, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. Um, and we're doing great work. And, but also in my observations of that, you know, I thought about, you know, my own ways that I've connected with nature, how I've made formative connections and things that have been inspiring and transformative to me. And a lot of times those things didn't happen in large groups of people on fast paced type uh, regimented programs. And um, and that's not what ours is, but there are elements of that 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 need to be there in order to to accommodate. But I've always and should and should always ask myself, you know, is this is this the optimal way to get these folks connected to nature based on what I know in my own experiences and then the body of research that I've been exposed to, like I mentioned earlier, through through some other colleagues and place based education a sense of place, uh, phenomenology, these types of things. And um, so in that, in, in kind of auditing our programs, looking around, talking with these other colleagues, and as I said, getting introduced to, to this, uh, to the mindfulness-based research, um, you know, I became aware of really what we're probably most familiar with, is 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 a state of experience um or a state of mind that's really uh not mindful right that's mindlessness and um you know one way to to kind of conceive of that concept is you know you can get in your car right this morning you you get in your vehicle or even on your bicycle 
and you make your way to work and you get to work. And then if I asked you about what you saw or what you noticed or what happened on your drive between your home and coming into work this morning, you know, a lot of us wouldn't, wouldn't know, right. We wouldn't even know what to say. We wouldn't remember. It's almost like we just sort of got here on autopilot, right. Uh, with little sense of connection or being in the moment or paying attention to, to the details and maybe some, in some sense, that's a good thing, right. That some of these routine type, um, uh, maneuvers and, and engagements sort of free up some kind of larger, you know, prefrontal cortex. It's a, some larger uh, senses of awarenesses because we can sort of depend on some of these routine actions to be there. But even with uh, not having to expend so much attention and mental energy on sort of some of these kind of routine tasks, we still a lot of times just don't even uh, take in anything new anyway. Right. And so mindless, uh, mindlessness, uh, has, has a couple of key aspects to it that are important to, to, to differentiate and to tease out. One is that the past overdetermines the present, right? So in looking for patterns and looking for categorization, um, you know, what we have seen in the past can kind of dictate what we anticipate, want to see, expect to see, you know, in the present, right? And that we get trapped inside of a, a single perspective, right? Where we get uh, into the into this routine, seeing things in one way, past over determining the present. Present, um, we lose a sensitivity to context, to outliers to to nuance to uh creativity we kind of get into a mindless routine and that and that rules and routines sort of govern the day and as i mentioned earlier a lot of times that that type of approach might serve us well in efficiency in standardization in linear type engagements point a to point b uh, in some sense of factual engagement, even a even a, a comfort or a sense of being right uh, or predetermined a priori. Um, but when you begin kind of taking that state of experience and applying it to uh, nature connection, which is also linked to climate change, climate awareness, uh, stewardship, uh, problem solving, you know, all these other dynamic processes. Uh, and uh, that's not the kind of state of experience and engagement that is going to promote transform transformational change and also uh, being connected in deeply and in a way and in a heightened sense of noticing and engagement that. Uh, is relative to um, a lot of the type of advocacy that we want to promote and see happen with the visitors who come to our center. So, I mean, the case in point, if 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 these kids don't have some kind of formative, emotive, uh, felt, uh, you know, phenomenological sense of engagement and connection with the natural world. Um, you know, the likelihood that these folks, these kids are going to go on and be advocates and sacrifice uh, for the environment to defend it, to maybe even pursue careers that are related to that, you know, the likelihood is pretty low, right? And so, so we've got to look at a different state of experience, a different way about going about connecting people, particularly young people to nature if we're going to see any kind of durability and resiliency in environmental ecological behavior attitudes, uh, these types of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this, uh, little video works. I've got it embedded here. Let's try it out. This is just a great, uh, example of some of the, 
things that I've been talking about here. Uh, let's see if I can get it to work. Uh, Rob, the uh, slides have not been changing. Have you this been? Ah, okay. Well, that doesn't, let's see here. Are they changing now? Yes, they are. Okay, great. Thank you, Patty. Let's see if I can get this to work. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> this bit. Okay. Um... If I can was get there it. really a gorilla in the first video? Because <laughs> I totally missed it. Yes. <laughs> wow. Did you, did, you, Robert, did, you, did you see it on the second one? I got 14. I did see it in the second one, but I'm like, no way was that in the first time. <laughs> oh, I, I only got 13. I, I must have missed a couple of this. <laughs> yeah, right. And so I definitely I got 16. <laughs> yeah. Always always the overachiever. <clears throat> um so that's a <clears throat> that's a great little excerpt on selective attention. And so when we go back about and apply that to particularly educating young people or even adults, really, you know, the minute we as educators frame up and dictate what the student is supposed to be paying attention to so right they can come out even on this lovely natural site but if it's scripted if their engagement is scripted and, and they need to find and see certain things as evidenced in this selective attention test you know people once there's a directive given you know you can uh block out all of their input and only focus on uh, one specific thing, where even so much so that a black, you know, a large gorilla can come across your screen and you don't even see it. You see it, but you don't recognize it. Uh, and that's, you know, in some sense, that's maybe paying really good attention because that wasn't part of the directions, right? But when we're talking about people young people adults too introducing them to nature asking them to make connections you know we need to be really careful about how we frame that up right um because they may miss things that uh others might miss as well but that 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 may be some really profound information connections and some outliers right if we script the whole thing uh, an, an, uh, an arena for uh, creativity, problem solving, uh, personal connection, these types of uh, states of experience are, are left out. And so that gives us, brings us to this, this uh, state of experience called mindfulness. And I'll tell you, I, I, I did an entire lit review on this stuff. And um you know, one of the things, there's a lot of critiques about mindfulness, particularly in terms of Western mindfulness or how we in our culture tend to grab onto something, um, change it, modify it, co-modify it for our benefit and uh, and give little homage or recognition or um, to, you know, to the origins from which it came. And that would be 
you know, I suspect everybody on this call has heard of mindfulness, but then we hear about it a lot. We're flooded with it a lot. Um, but I certainly couldn't engage in this talk by not saying that, you know, this is a, this is from, it has Eastern origins uh, related to, you know, Buddhist thought and practice, right? And really, it's interesting in that in uh, mindfulness or right mindfulness or sati is part of this noble pathway to enlightenment. And mindfulness is one of the ways to uh, prevent the, the wheel of suffering, right, that goes on. And so there's almost a, a mindfulness is a way out of self um, self interest, self thought, right, selfishness, and, and that's one of the uh, states of experience. The selfishness is that that kind of promotes this ongoing suffering. And so really, John Kabat Zen took meditative mindfulness and really brought it over uh, to to the West and did a lot with mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, is, is a, is a, a way uh, to, to reduce stress and post, post-traumatic stress. Um, and then uh, Ellen Langer from Harvard uh, really has, has sort of the, the, uh, the, one of the foremost experts and leaders on, you know, mindfulness research. And so there's there's different kind of aspects of mindfulness floating around. You could say one is, at least in the Western world, one would be a meditative mindfulness, which is using mindfulness as a way to to um, you know yeah to meditate right a meditative state uh, where Ellen Langer and her associates are doing more with like creative mindfulness, more about um, noticing being present and noticing and that's that's not to say that that wouldn't have some meditative aspects to it but it it, it is different right it, it's studying mindfulness um from a different approach as opposed from meditation stress reduction as opposed to more creative novelty and noticing and so this definition in front of you that's really related to uh creative mindfulness as um, as espoused by uh, Langer and Associates, and so in in juxtaposition to mindfulness and autopilot or mindlessness and autopilot, we have this mindfulness state, and it's an active state of mind um, where uh, some of the characteristics are are. Uh, involve making novel distinctions so 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 it, it's not an inactive state of mind right it's an act it's an active state of mind so your mind is engaged you're almost aware of that maybe it's a practice maybe it's something you're committing to you're committing to being fully engaged you're you're fully here in the present moment uh so the past doesn't over to over uh determine the present but you're fully here you know, be here, be, be here, be, be here now, right? Um, you're sensitive to context and perspective. So there, there's an awareness in your noticing and in your present state that this, that what you're seeing and what you're experiencing around you is, is one is contextual, right? That it's not just generic and, and across the board, but there's a sense of context to where you are there's a, a there's a sensitive uh, the sensitivity to perspective right so the perspectives aren't singular in nature but there's multiple perspectives there's uh, there's textured and nuanced context um there are it is this state is rule and routine guided so it's not just hey walk out in the woods and whatever happens happens no it's uh it's actually kind of difficult to to obtain this state in a way um because our attentions are so ruthlessly mined in our society that you know being able to clear out um all of these distractions to fully be in and we all know that right to 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 fully be here in the present moment noticing uh heightened awareness 
right here, right now. That, that, that's a difficult thing to achieve. And so there are some some rules and some routines that guide that practice, but it's not totally predetermined, right? And then in essence, I, I don't know if you've ever come across like Chicksamahai's uh, flow theory or savoring or vital engagement, uh, any of those states of experiences, you know, where you you lose sense of self and time and you're you're fully here in the moment. Um, but it's this phenomenological experience um, of engagement, mindfulness is. And so I want to introduce another concept here and then we'll kind of start pulling it all together is this this practice of interpretation. And here at uh, the Meadows Center, we have these lovely interpreters, right, which are our Texas State students, many of them whom are probably in your classes in wildlife biology or geography, uh, philosophy, recreation. But anyway, they, they are here and they're the ones leading these environmental tours. They're leading the kayaking tours. They're driving the boats. They're uh, leading children and, and adults and, and uh, folks through this place. And really, they're the conduit. They're basically taking their the things that they know and connecting people with this place <clears throat> and getting and hopefully doing that in a way that's uh, provocative, that's emotive, that's engaging, that's also based in good you know, solid information and not just uh, Mark Twain type storytelling. Although Mark Twain says, you know, don't ever let the truth get in the way of a good story. So, but, but it needs to be engaging, but, but rooted in, um, you know, real time information, but they're, they're the conduit. They're the, they're the link between uh, this place and the people and trying to weave that together in a, in a, uh, generative and formative type uh, way. Um, and so take take taking all of that into uh, in, in this pot of gumbo that we're making right now, me and Stephen uh, uh, Anthony Derringer over in uh, recreation, we got together and we started to wonder what, uh, you know, we, we read about mindfulness and we read about nature connection, but we haven't really come across much work where people in people who are the conduits or the interpreters of nature experience, what's their engagement with mindfulness? Is there any kind of training or practice or how would they, how would their engagement in a mindfulness program maybe affect their, their interpretation? And so we did this, um, uh, uh, really cool four week study. We took our uh, a lot of our interpreters. We put them through uh, a, a lot of really awesome mindful type interventions. It was a qualitative study. We we uh, we used constructivist grounded theory. It was an interview study, uh, and we were able to kind of suss out some pretty pretty awesome themes. Some that we kind of expected we would probably see, but others that. Uh, were more pronounced or ones that we just hadn't hadn't considered um, altogether. And I'll also say too, one of the studies in our lit review that really kind of shook us a bit was one by um, by Ellen Langer and talking about mindfulness as a psychological attractor and the effect on children. And so um, you know, you can you can read right there in the in the abstract that um uh, you know, we tested the hypothesis that mindfulness is a perceived and preferred by children and B has positive effects on them. The results indicate that children ages nine through 12, not only prefer to interact with mindful adults, but devalue themselves following a mindless interaction, despite the fact that the only positive, that only positive content was discussed. So this was basically a summer baseball camp with children and um they the, the some children interacted with the mindful uh camp counselors after the baseball program and it was all positive but they they were talking to the children and asking them specifically hey what you what you have to tell me right now is really important and so i'm really curious and 
in what you're going in your answers to these questions, as opposed to the mindless counselors who are real positive and upbeat, but we're like, hey, you know, I don't want to waste your time with this. Let's just get through these questions real quickly, this, that, the other. And, you know, the, the thing that really kind of stopped us in our tracks is that these kids know, the, the kids know when you're not paying attention, right? They know when you're going through the motions. They know when you're mindless. They know when you're, you're even when you're smiling and trying to be upbeat, if you're not really there and have a genuine care and an interest in what they're saying, uh, and you're not fully present in the moment, uh, some of those, some of those kids can walk away feeling like, God forbid that, you know, that, that they were the cause of that, right? That they, it must have been something about them that caused you to not be interested in them. And I can tell you when, when we read that, I thought, my God, you know, we, we don't want that happening here, right? I mean, some of these kids, their, their engagements, their, their opportunities to equitably and and uh, positively engage with nature in a positive, informative way, that some of those opportunities are are pretty slim. And so when they get one and it happens to be out here, I mean, we, we, we've got to get the marrow out of that engagement. We need to be here. We need to be tuned in and caring and paying attention. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there's some challenges with that, right? When you're cranking through, um, you know, 400 students here in a day and you're, you're going through these pr programs and maybe you've been doing this, you know, for a year and you've led the same tour in the same boat and you just get in that mindless type routine, you know? And so we disrupted that with our research to see, see what would happen. <clears throat> and we did these, really cool interventions. Um, we, we took time. It was a small group. Like I said, I think there were nine, maybe 10 participants. Uh, we did a lot of noticing walks. Uh, we went out in the preserve, walked around with this uh, sense that, you know, hey, your body can lead you to remarkable discoveries. You know, I mean, so many, so many of us are completely disembodied, right? We're just in this cognitive realm, particularly at the academy, right? It's like, you know, cognition and thought is just trumps anything else. And, um, you know, we, we did a lot of work on paying attention to our physical selves, right? And, and that, hey, your body is like this receptor, receptor, you know, this body radar doing away with preconceived notions opening yourself up to, to a tier of experience that, that is going to unfold for you non-judgmentally and going on walks and working on expanding our awarenesses. Um, we did nature sketching. We sketched a lot of things. We used little jeweler's loops. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like a little uh, like magnifying glass. We did these zoom in activities where you would scan the horizon and find something that interests you and you would draw it and then you would uh, move in, you know, 10 paces and draw it again and then closer and then finally where you're just locked in on the most minute details with this jeweler's loop and kind of the, how that thing changes as you get closer to it. We took, uh, did 360 drawings where what what would the same object look like, you know, from from a bird's eye view or what would it look like looking the other way, but really kind of opening up our, um, you know, our tactile drawing, uh, fine motor skill detail type things. Uh, we moved even closer. We, we looked at, at the water a lot. We moved closer with we kayaking. We felt the water. We moved even closer. Still, we got in, we snorkeled. Uh, we, we, we drew some of the things that we, saw on the kayaks or in the snorkeling. We went on a glass bottom boat ride. We had solo experiences where we moved out of groups and people had time to wander, be by themselves. A lot of contemplative type uh, engagements. We had stories of the day where we would come back from wandering around and then come and then share out on our stories. Um, we had focus groups. We did journaling, uh, prompted journals, 
Uh, we did some some um, mindful type listening meditations, um, a lot of engaging senses, and it was it was really it was really a a, a powerful experience. Um, and one of the things too, when we talked about like engaging our senses and opening that up and kind of going back to sort of the, you know, how we uh, prioritize uh, and privilege cognition and thinking and objectivity, you know, to the, um, you know, to the detriment or the, you know, to, to our disembodied selves, right? This, this guy Cohen, uh, documented 53 natural senses. I mean, think about that. So we, we think about, you know, smell, taste, touch, hear, see, but, but we have all these other senses that are available to us, right? Like we, we come into the world equipped with all of these ways of making sense and of, and understanding and connecting with our world and with people around us. But yet we 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 privilege such a small fraction of that. And I kind of contend that, you know, the types of experience, in fact, you know, there's there's whole uh, things written on the extinction of experience, like like good holistic formative experience, uh, you know, a lot of quality, you know, experiences, particularly in the educational realm are are becoming truncated less and less and less about you know the student right it's almost like many times the curriculum is predetermined prior to the student ever walking in as if they're just these empty vessels that need to know these things right but you know at least where i come from you know epistemologically and, and pedagogically is you know they are the content of the course they're very much the content of the course if there's no connection there um you know what what's the longevity of that information particularly in terms of coming out here to our site to know what this is it can't exist as this separate entity it has to be i believe within and it has to be if we're gonna if we're gonna make any gains environmentally i mean when we look around and see all the challenges that we have and we're tasked with educating young people um you know it better be good, right? It better be formative. It better, we need to use everything that we have. And so if we if we come equipped in the world to make all these kind of connections, you know, we, we ought to, to think about that in, in our design, in our curriculum, in our field environmental philosophy and our engagements, right? And so just kind of looking through some of these lists of um, sensory experiences, you know, like think we have a sense of time or, we have this sense of appetite and hunger, you know, a sense of season. Isn't that interesting? You can look at a picture and even from the lighting tell that the picture was taken in the fall or it was taken in the spring, you know, just not necessarily by the colors of the leaves, but even just kind of the light, there's a sense of that. A sense of one's visibility, right? Like, I feel like I'm being watched right now. You know, um, proximity, fear, a sense of play, uh, emotional belonging, a sense of community, even tacit knowing, right? These things that are inevitable in quality. I know it to be true. I just can't really tell you what it is. It's this tacit or this foreknowledge, uh, intuition, right? Uh, the sublime, uh, spiritual, sixth sense. Um, I bet like, you know, all of us, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but I bet I'm right, is that everyone on this call has had this experience where, you know, you're thinking about somebody that you care about or love, and then all of a sudden your phone rings, and it's them. I mean, we've all had that, right? I, I, I think I can safely say that. But what is that? Like, you know, I mean, how does that, how does that happen, right? Like, it, it, it Point is, I think we we devalue or we get mindless or in these routines, which just absolutely can truncate a lot of our ability to know things and explore things and engage with things. 
And so some of the themes and the questions and things that came out of the study. Um, so one of the things was, is that students talked about, you know, I didn't, uh, they had a fuller experience of the place when they slowed down and when they mindfully engaged with Spring Lake, meaning even though they'd been here for a year, some of them, and even though they had run probably uh, over a hundred tours, when they stopped and went through this mindful program, they saw new things, made new connections, and had a deeper sense of experience. Even though they've walked that trail a hundred times over, they saw something new. So the point is, is that even the, that that repetition. So so slow knowledge. There's something to be said for that, like going back again and again and again. But it's also how you go back. And like you could do something a hundred times over, but it isn't until you maybe slow down and open yourself up and engage in sort of a mindful type approach to seeing and looking that then then these other more formative connections are, are made. And that, and that happened and they talked about that. And they talked about that's not something that they're going to be able to do on the job or uh by leading like and again that's that it's a practice right like you have to be intentional and set space aside for it in order for that to happen so that's in, it's instructive for our staff training you know do we have that built in do we have that built in in uh, periodically over the course of a year where we can step back and re-engage or we just kind of have the baseline curriculum and, and going through it. And, and, you know, and, and we're guilty of all of it. We do some of it right. We do some of it wrong, but um, that, that even, even when you have a set of students, like maybe they're studying wildlife biology, that couldn't be more motivated and committed and love being here. And they're leading these tours, even still like slowing down and, and, and making space for this, bread came out of that like we you know we need to keep doing that um um and, and interestingly enough a lot of these students said you know when it some of the coolest things they ever saw during while they were working out here was like uh you know maybe it starts raining and there aren't any tours and they're down at the boat dock and they're just kind of hanging out down there there's nothing going on and they would so many of them talked about these things that they would see and notice and you, you know you can kind of kind of you can see it right falling into this uh state of experience where everything slows down you're not hurried it's raining you don't have anywhere else to be and then you start seeing things and noticing things um a reflection was a key piece like the ability to uh share for the for these research participants interpreters students for them to be able to to uh, share what they what they encountered with others the focus groups but also even the stories of the day the coming back together in a reflective nature um with some guided reflection was was key uh because other people would see things some people would see the same things or experience the same things but had a different take on it and, the, and that kind of uh weaving together of the group experience was was generative um people talked about it's easier it was a lot easier to notice things when snorkeling you know it's a little easier to notice things when the experience is novel but more difficult when you're hurried or ha just have to have to do it or you've done it over 15 20 different times you know it, it, get, it gets more challenging hence the practice like mindful practice um we we also noticed that some of the some of the kids that come out on our trips, uh, you know, they 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 might need some more noticing skills. I mean, they're just kind of vibrating with energy, and we've kind of felt like they almost need to tend to that first, right? They almost need to kind of come and run around and jump up and move around and get moving and moving moving their bodies, and then kind of start bringing in the noticing pieces like the, like there's a there's teachable moments there right and they have a very difficult time noticing or slowing down uh particularly when they first get here they kind of need to speed up first before they slow down 
Um, this is a, a pretty cool poem by uh, Mary Oliver. So uh, when we were um, when we were doing one of the mindfulness programs with these research participants, the mosquitoes were were so bad. <laughs> And um, everybody was off kind of on a solo experience. <clears throat> and we were going to meet back up at Sycamore Point at the specified time and talk about everything. And everybody was out doing their thing. And we just got bashed by mosquitoes. And so people started kind of, you know, you could tell you're looking around and people are hurrying back like they're there 10 minutes before they're supposed to be there. And so I kind of all of a sudden all collectively were there hurried and together like, oh, my God, this is terrible. And in this sort of collective surrender, we just waited in the lake. Right. We just sort of moved into the water, kind of waist deep and kind of put the water in our arms and sort of got away from the from the mosquitoes and then we were there together in the water and you know prior to that moment there was also some feedback from you know we're out okay we're out in spring lake and we're being mindful now what you know i'm like supposed to really pay attention what's supposed to happen here you know and and we even felt that as researchers like sometimes you're just sort of trying to have a state of experience you're not really sure if you're pretending or is it really happening or what you know there's there's moments when it gets you but there's moments when you're sort of don't really know what it is anyway so you know i'm thinking oh this activity has gone south you know these mosquitoes anyway we're all in the water and then we're just kind of there and everybody's sort of getting relief and then you look around and everybody's you know, kind of running their hands over the top of the water. And we're all, you know, we're just sort of looking around. So now we're all kind of having this sort of shared moment. And then these incredible, you know, egrets came down to roost at Cypress Point in this big, beautiful, bald cypress tree. And the, and the egrets, you know, all this white, it's like, it's the most idyllic setting. Like the sun's going down by behind JCK, the lake has this black orange color you have these beautiful green cypress and all these like white snowballs coming down out of the sky and we just watched this whole thing go on and no one said a word and i mean we didn't process it we didn't we just left it right there it was awesome and in following up following up on that in some journals and some guided discussions not that day but later on i mean people kept referencing that like oh my gosh and uh, and then somebody shared out this poem from Mary Oliver, and it, it really meant a lot to us. And and one of the things that we took from that, um, both researcher and participant, was, you know, sometimes the responsibility is just to go looking, you know, just to open yourself up. And sometimes things happen, and sometimes they don't. Um, but despite our clumsiness or not knowing, there there is value in trying to live and and connect in a certain way and um and that was that was pretty powerful for us and so some of the next steps right we we did the research on what happens with interpreters we 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 got the we we got the findings we've included mindfulness in in our um some of our staff development and training right um we we've developed a mindfulness program for uh, a K through 12 program uh, that that you know people can come out and instead of doing four or five different programs that that encapsulate this experience we have one long slow immersive program that has these mindfulness kind of engaging senses concepts and yes they go on a boat ride and yes they go to the wetlands but it's all in this backdrop of being here now and we've also developed uh, climate Explorers program for in around climate change education and a centerpiece thing of that is is mindfulness, right? Like, you know, part of climate change is noticing the changes that are happening in and around you, in your community, in this space, in the in the environment, and being attentive to that and paying attention. I mean, mindfulness is is a is a cornerstone piece of being present and understanding change in your environment. And so um, 
So yeah, and then we hope that we hope to further develop some of the the mindfulness programs. But we that 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 from that study, a lot of tentacles have gone out into into our climate programs. We're also doing some um, teacher development workshops. We're putting together one right now for a uh, teacher development workshop for for uh, uh, public school educators, right? And a centerpiece of that is going to be mindful engagement and how to engage with students mindfully and incorporate these concepts into, into field experience. Um, yeah, there's this cool picture of a snowy egret that I, I thought I'd end with. Um, but that that's a little bit about what's happening over in Spring Lake and some of the research that we've got going on in and around mindfulness and nature connection. And um, I appreciate your time and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, good afternoon, Rob. This is Trey. I just thought I would uh, ask a quick question. You know, we, we're always trying to uh, get a message across to somebody in some way or form. So when we have a, a curated experience, how much did the research show? And I think you were speaking to that some in reflection. We have to be able to give space for someone to have that formative opinion and come to a conclusion but we also have to be mindful of the freedom that it might not be the conclusion we wanted them to come to. How did that inter interact with the study? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, so going back to interpretation, right. One of the, one of the founding principles of that is um, um, conversation, right. To a, so we do a lot of telling, you know, we do a lot of telling, but we, we are trying to, uh, one, one of the seminal pieces, we're trying to connect with people's kind of universal values or themes, right? And so uh, we're opening up a dialogue to ask. To, so we're not just in there telling and we do we do too much of that. We get people on the boats. We, we do a lot of talking, <clears throat> but we need to ask some questions as well. <clears throat> and that takes time and that takes effort. Um, <clears throat> But there are some specific people can make their own connections. I know I'm, I'm I'm kind of taking a long way around the barn here, but to your point, I think there may be some key points that we would want, say, children to to know and understand and arrive at, and we can ask questions to get them thinking and maybe you know, we're guiding a, a response, but uh, guiding them to a, a response that we want them to give that's based on maybe some factual objective information that they need to know. But I would contend too that we also need to let them come up with their own answers or their own interpretations of things. Otherwise, going back to the beginning of the video, we're basically fishing for a specific answer and we're basically uh they're not going to see the jumping gorilla in front of them because we've already predetermined what they need to see what's valuable to see so i think some of those concepts guiding students in a way to where they're gonna they're gonna discover some things that we're hoping they will discover is important but there also has to be a space for you know, for, for some, for some personal discovery there and then being, being able to give voice to that and that being valuable in and of its own right, not necessarily in something that supports this larger idea that we want uh, represented. I don't know if that, that got Trey, if that got quite what you were asking, but. Yeah, no, I think that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm worried now that there's been gorillas moving in my life and I've had no idea because I've Maybe. not been able to see them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still blown away by that video. Um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a good one. Hey, Rob, I was going to ask, that's really frightening about the, the children, you know, being able to sense the, attention and oh God, yeah. presence 
And I'm curious, like how much of your research and this type of program is um, taking into account eye contact? Because I've heard recently, you know, that, that people are losing that like, sense of um, engagement and, you know, tool as a way of communicating or, or listening. And so have you found um, that to be something that's, that's um, stands out or not? Yeah, I think, um, so I, I can't like um, quote a specific research study, but I, one thing I do know, you know, even for my own daughter, who's a little on the spectrum with autism, not just barely, but we're seeing, we see more and more people, even in our interpreters, we see more and more people with, you know, that have things that are challenges that that uh, with connecting with others, right? Whether it be anxiety or attention deficit. I mean, I think all of us would know that we're, we're feeling more and more of that. And so it does put a premium on uh, a, a for an interpreter to create a type of environment where they're going to have to be, they're going to have to really be there. They're going to have to really use eye contact. They're really going to have to talk. And one of the things that we've figured out is that we can provide folks with fantastic information, interpreters like, okay, this is the information that we need conveyed. Uh, these are the techniques. We can practice it. We can do it. But one one thing that we've noticed through observation is, is that there's there's another level like you can almost see it as an educator you can almost see where when you're watching one of these interpreters and you're watching a group and it's kind of lining up to this awesome teachable moment either this is a concept we want them to understand or man they've uh, asked a great question that could really open up this other creative dialogue and you can just kind of sense it like Bess and I we, you can just kind of watch it happen and then the pivotal part is less about knowledge base and more about on the, on the part of the interpreter, but more about catching it. Like, Oh, this is, here it is. I need to make hay right here uh, and jumping in and, and seizing that moment. And a lot of interpreters miss it maybe. And they just let it go. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, and, and the program wasn't quite as salient as it could be. And I think going to your point, having interpreters that, I mean, that have public speaking abilities, but also kind of being really in tune with, with not only the content, but what the group is feeling and doing, behaving, how they're, there's a lot of nonverbal cues that would indicate that I have these, 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 these kiddos are right here with me, or they're somewhere else, you know, and we found that a lot of a lot of opportunities get missed when the interpreter's not clued in. And that could be either mindlessness or going through the motions, or they need more, they need more teaching skills. They need more facilitation skills. So yeah, I like your backdrop, by the way. That looks like West Cave Preserve. Close. It's uh near Crossy Springs. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.